Uh, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about holidays today. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Do you believe in life after addiction? You better believe it. Believe it. Believe it. Now, the host of Life After Addiction. Got him. Got him. Got him. Got him. Episode 60. Episode 60. 6 0, man. 6 0. We have done this this show 60 times. Man, we hope that you are enjoying this and it is an encouragement and hope filled and maybe educational and. Yeah, welcome back. We're back. We're back, baby. Nice and toasty in the studio. It's cold outside, so... Thanksgiving week. Thanksgiving week. Well, it's Thanksgiving day when you're watching this, hopefully. This comes out Thursday. Oh, okay. No, it doesn't. It comes out Friday. Yeah, so, so, that's... so yesterday, you ate a lot of turkey. You there ate a you lot go. of cookies and cakes and pies, and you rode roller coaster rides, and you saw giraffes and monkeys. You know, you did... Kids, yeah, kids Thanksgiving stuff. stuff. Thanksgiving stuff. So, so, <laughs> no, that was an excerpt from an old Dave Chappelle stand-up thing. Okay, okay. Uh, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna talk about holidays today. We're gonna talk about. Um, many of you maybe felt this way uh, this week, and then maybe still feeling this way if you're back home hanging out with family. And then we're gonna go into the Christmas season as well. And so we just want to address some stuff, man. We want to talk about. Uh, if you're someone who has walked in freedom, you've struggled with addiction in your past, or you're currently struggling with addiction, we want to address you, but we also want to address the ones around you and what they can expect, what they could look at, and things like that. And so, um, yeah, so that's the episode. We're going to talk about holiday seasons, things to look out for, things to avoid, things to dive into. Yeah. Uh, so why don't you kick us off, get us going. Yeah, um, holidays used to be some of my least favorite times in the midst of addiction. Now, obviously, there's two sides of that coin. I love family. I love being around family. I love spending time and catching up with my loved ones. But on the other side of that coin was addiction. Mm. And in my addiction, I hated every bit of going to family functions. And when I would go, I desired to stay as as short as possible, you know? Um, and part of that is because a lot of times whenever you go around family and you're catching up, well, when I'm living a life of debauchery and don't have much to talk about what I'm doing in life and yeah. how I'm growing and what's going on. And it's kind of like the, the elephant in the room that everyone knows what's going on, yeah. you know, so it's like trying to teeter around those conversations. It's just difficult. Um, so, yeah, for me, it was always tough to mm. when the holidays came around, such as Thanksgiving or Christmas, and I knew the family was getting together at my grandmother's. Yeah. Or I knew the family was getting together at my house. Um, there was always just this this uneasiness inside of me that just wanted to run, that wanted no part in it. And um, throughout the years, I don't know how many I missed, but I'm sure there was some that I wasn't present at. And even the ones I was present, I wasn't present, if yeah. that makes sense. Um, but yeah, I think something to look out for and something to be mindful of for families is just that, like, you know, your son, you know, your husband, you know, your nephew, you know, these men, and I'm speaking to men just because we're in an all male facility, right? Better than anyone. So if you feel like something's off and like I was explaining earlier, I'm a family man. I love spending time with my family. I love being around family. I love fellowshipping and just, uh, conversating and all these things, but they're hesitant to do these things and be in these predicaments or situations um, and spend time with their loved ones without it feeling like a hurry. Yeah. Your inkling is probably right. That something is off, especially if you are already thinking that man, he may be, you know, drinking too much. He may be smoking. He may be getting high. Um, he may be needing some help. We just don't know how to approach it. Yeah. Well, that's a sign to be aware of him avoiding family functions, him avoiding conversations, him avoiding those relationships will, that were once dear to him. That's probably a red flag. Number one. Yeah. And, and like, like you, you said, I mean, I think families, so world dress you, I think use discernment, you know, like you said, you know them best. And so if there's excuses that are said, like, I've got to work tonight mm-hmm. or, you know, and they're just, it seems like from the moment they got the, there or even beforehand, it's, it's set up to where they're only there a short amount of time. Yep. You know, if that makes you feel a certain way, you know, check that feeling out. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean you're right, but I would definitely say that feeling's there for a reason. It's probably a red flag. Other things would be like nodding out. 
you know, not, not in out uh, on the couch. And again, it's hard to discern because there could be a turkey coma happening. You know, it could be, it could be I ate too much or I didn't sleep enough. But eyes, eyes, your pupils being pinpoint, um, just just setting up setting up things to leave early or if they're gone to the bathroom a long time for often, you know, those kind of things. And so I think what we've said before and we'll say again is you just make it as easy as possible for someone to walk into a life of recovery and as hard as possible for them to stay in a life of addiction. Amen. And I guess the question would be is, hey, this your son, your dad, your brother, your sister, mom, aunt, uncle, whoever it may be, your loved one, haven't seen them in a while, now all of a sudden it's holidays, you just saw them at Thanksgiving and something seemed off, what do I do next? Well, I think next, and this will lead me to my first scripture, I think this is in Matthew chapter 18, this is verse 15, it says, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now, this is, the, and then it says if he refuses, you go to the church, you bring it before the whole church, that kind of thing. Obviously, this is church discipline if someone sins against you. But I think the principle still plays in the aspect of if you feel something's wrong, address it. Be assertive. Not accusational, but assertive. Like, hey, man, I noticed you're nodding out. Oh, yeah, I was just tired, didn't sleep the night before, um, you know, ate too much. There's going to be an excuse. There's going to be a defense to keep what's in the dark to stay in the dark. But the reason that he didn't like staying long, the reason I didn't like staying long, the reason your family member maybe doesn't like staying long is because we don't like, when you're in the darkness, you don't like the light. And so if you're exposed and there's a lot of people around, you're probably going to try to get in and get out as quick as possible so that light doesn't expose your darkness. And so engage. Engage and judge the response, right? Here's what, man, I'm a little worried about you. I know that maybe you had some struggle in the past and just looked off. Privately do that with them. Sit them down, you know, take them to lunch, call them, uh, and then weigh the response. I, I, it's not going to be a good response. Spoiler. Yeah. <laughs> Spoiler, it's not going to be, thank you, you noticed me, I'm on drugs. It won't be that, right? No. It's going to be an attempt to deflect, but if you just discern, you know, and maybe you're off, maybe you could be off, but just discern. If it's like, if it's admit nothing, deny everything, and they start making immediate counter accusations, well, that that's... Normally, that's a red flag too, right? If, if, if I'm starting to blame others, or did you not see someone else? They try to change the subject. That's a red flag. And then, you know, and just discern what that is. And if you still feel like that, that, that wasn't honest, then take someone else with you. Sit them down again. Call on a two-way call. Hey, I've got Ryan here with me. And, brother, man, we just love you. And we're, we're just concerned. You know, we're, we, we literally love you. And, and we want to address this again. And I know you told me this. I just, something didn't feel right about it. And so step one is be assertive. And, and if, if you've seen the forgotten pandemic, you know one of the things that we say is, Silence is deadly, right? Um, if you're afraid to say something because it might be the wrong thing or whatever and someone can go and die, well, they are dying by the groves. You know, I feel like we talk about this all the time. They are dying. Yeah. Um, silence is deadly. Speak up. Be vocal. Um, have resources in mind. If, if you have any kind of relationship with a, with a faith-based recovery place or some kind of interventionist or something like that, maybe do your homework beforehand. Call them and get some personal. Tell them what's going on. Have a little bit of um, strategy going into it because on the off chance that God just breaks them in that moment and they repent and confess and they say, I need help, and then be able to know what you're doing, what those next steps are. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I would say this too. There's never a good time to address no. a loved one about addiction. Whether it's it's always drugs, a bad alcohol, time. It's, it's, there's, never, there's never a time. So if you're waiting for a time, a moment, a season that's just perfectly and feels right, and this might be the, the best time to approach it, the time is always now. Yeah. And the best way to do it, like you said, is, man, present in love an opportunity to get help. Yeah. And exactly like you said, make it as hard as possible for them to continue an addiction and allow them to cause their family members to enable them. Yeah. Because what needs to happen, the approach needs to be the family stand on a solidified front yeah. of, hey, your dark is being brought to light. We still love you despite we know this is not you, but we will no longer condone nor enable the behavior that is happening. 
So the second you are ready to get help, because yes, that individual has to make, has to, has to answer the call to respond and desire help yeah. more than you desire it for them. But what needs to happen is the family stand on a solidified front saying, hey, we will no longer co-sign, endorse, or allow you to become codependent on us yeah. just to manipulate and lie and deceive and feed a habit. Yeah. And that's something that's extremely hard for families to do. I watched how hard it was for my own family to do. But it's so necessary to um, just initiate those those initial steps to getting help. Yeah, and, and I think <clears throat> this is great. I think this is great advice. I think most of the time families do have some sort of leverage that they can imply, like, hey, I'm not going to – do this if you continue doing this yes. or if you're not honest about this. There are times, though, that, you know, someone's self-sufficient or they're just like, I don't need you, and they're homeless or they are they have a job and they're able to somewhat pay their bills, but their life's falling apart and you see it and they don't necessarily need you for any kind of sustenance. I, I think in all moments, especially those, the power of prayer is something that you lean on. You're not afraid of the conversations. You step into them. You engage in them even though... <laughs> It's going to be hard, and they're going to say hurtful things. Mm. They, they are. I did, and they know exactly where to stab. They know exactly where to twist. It's going to get you upset because if you get upset, it discredits. If you show an emotion, if you are um, angry, it discredits your accusation. It's just a tactic. It's a, a self-defense mechanism. So knowing all of that, press in and have the conversation anyway. Bring someone else into it. Bring your whole family into it, and if that's not enough— continue to pray that God breaks them, that God breaks their heart, that God draws them to someone that they will listen to, that there is a moment that he um, just touches them and they repent and they're like, I need help. Pray for those things. Pray for those things. Please pray for those things because there's power in prayer, like power in prayer. Yeah. Uh, and I don't want to say do those things. I any Just do that if nothing else. I mean, there's power in that. You should be doing that the whole way around. Praying that God breaks them. And, and man, a lot of times that breaking doesn't look like you, what you and I think. Uh, I've heard countless stories of jail being God breaking them or uh, moms praying for a son for protection and just protect him tonight. And he's arrested and she's angry about that and then realized that was actually God protecting her son, yeah. right? Getting him off the streets with all this nasty fentanyl and everything. So let's take a quick break. We'll be back uh, and continue on the subject. Uh, we really want to talk to you, though, if you're someone struggling, and we know there's all sorts of families that do have alcohol at these events, or maybe that's what you did your whole life, or you could never, you haven't been to a holiday in 10 years without some kind of substance happening. We want to talk with you, too. Um, bear with us. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Two in a row. <laughs> Two in a row. We're back. We're back. Um, so Ryan, what would you say to, let's say someone's fresh out of rehab, maybe someone's 10 months out of rehab, 12 months out of rehab, but this is the first Thanksgiving, uh, with family, high pressure, yeah. not knowing what to expect. Maybe their family does or doesn't drink. What's some, what's some good advice that you would give the guy that's gone through an addiction or yeah. the gal that's gone through an addiction? I think identity is super important because yeah. I remember those first few holidays after, finding Christ and finding freedom. And it's still hard Yeah, because you're so accustomed to having fear arise, having insecurities arrive, having the feelings that I used to feel prior to finding freedom come up every time I would put myself in these situations. And so your mind immediately goes to what are they thinking? What is my aunt thinking? What is my uncle thinking? Is my grandparents judging me? Yeah. What does my parents think? Do they think I'm high? Now I feel like, okay, now I, I can't move this way. I can't do this moment, this movement because they may think I'm drinking. I know this may sound crazy, but these are like legitimate things oh, that yeah. go through your head. Oh um, yeah. So it's remembering who you are in Christ and who mm. he says I am. It's vital to not only continuing um, in freedom, but just even uh, going back into those places of intimacy and building back those relationships with your family. Because 
for most of us, those relationships probably weren't the best. If this is your yeah. first time back at a holiday, back at a Thanksgiving, back at a Christmas and be understanding of your loved ones who are going to want to have conversations about how you're doing, about how things have been going. Um, sometimes, uh, not sometimes, a lot of times as men, we don't like being smothered. We don't like being suffocated. And it can feel that way sometimes, like as if almost you're getting babied, like, oh, it's going to be okay. You're going to, and that kind of causes us to push people yeah. away. But just be understanding if your loved ones are wanting to have certain conversations that may get on your nerves, may frustrate you. Uh, something I noticed, and I've said it before, is the more that I walked in righteousness, the more that I walked out my faith um, in the manner that God had called me to walk, the less I would get offended when someone questioned me, when yeah. someone would doubt me, when someone would say something yeah. um, that I didn't like, the less and less it would affect me because deep down in my spirit, in my soul, I knew how I was living. Yeah. The times where I get really frustrated and really angry and I want to lash out and I want to say something combative is because it's true and yeah. I'm not living the right way. So that's another thing to be mindful of. Man, it's so I think back to like the conversations I used to have with my mom or my dad or, you know, certain loved ones that I would just make them feel like the bad guy, like so manipulative, yeah. just such a condescending liar to try and push everything that I should own up to onto somebody else. And man, it's sickening. So even to families, I know that's got to be hard to deal with. Like I address certain things, but then he comes back at me with all this banter and all these things that are wrong and all these because and mm. this is why and. I know that's got to be hard, but understand that's not coming from a place <clears throat> where this where this man even believes it himself. Yeah, it's literally just to get you to go and chase, go down different rabbit trails and uh, to chase something that's irrelevant to the actual situation, which is him addressing these things within himself and and having to turn from them. Yeah, man, that that's so good. And, and, and I'll just add to that. I mean, the, the reason. A couple things I want to respond to. One, I mean, it legitimately, you might be saying you haven't been around family, the anxiety, the stress of family tough. for years without some sort of substance to help numb that or to whatever. And and that's why we, and we talked about this recently, but that's why we do the outdoor activities. That's why we yeah. do things uh, at S2L during the program, we take men out of the house, out of the comfort zone and go and do things like paintball, go and do things like swimming or canoeing or, um, uh, to the gym, to what, all these different events, movies. And we always, you know, is anyone drunk or high? No. Did everyone have fun? Yes. Well, let that be a reminder. You don't have to have you drunk or high or don't have to have a substance in your body to have fun and laugh. So, so know that it is possible, uh, whatever, part of life it is possible if this is your whether it's a month or if it's 10 months this is your first thanksgiving or, or holiday season without a substance know that it's possible number one number two <laughs> what ryan said about identity is absolutely true no one especially early in the game and maybe forever we're not promised anything and i gotta start clicking i'm sorry producer joins like hey you know that sound is gonna ruin everything uh -huh. sorry uh the the you're the only one that needs to know your new creation in your heart. People might not believe it. People might not know. And, and, and here's the deal. They probably won't at first. And that can't phase you. That can't bother you. Like, it's kind of insulting, but they weren't with you for the last however long you were there. They haven't seen your walk with Christ. They don't know what's going on in your heart. They don't know that God took a heart of stone and gave you a beating heart of flesh and that he's wooed you. And that's okay. You know why? Because the chaos and the lack of trust we we caused. Yeah. And so here's what I will promise you. Well, I can't promise you because other families, I don't know. Here's what I'm very confident will happen. The, the response of people will be bad, um, but they don't know what to do either. They're probably not wanting to be bad. They're probably not wanting you to think that they're thinking about it. So they don't like know where to put their hands, you know, in the same way that you were saying, the guy that struggles, I don't want to look like this because they're going to think this. Yeah. I think it's the same thing for family, especially loving families that are fighting for forgiveness. That's a process, by the way, that you got to allow uh, your family to go through. Um, it, it, just like you weren't healed overnight, they're, they're not either. And so they might, it's going to be awkward. And you just remember, as Chitty said, your identity. Remember who you are in Christ and just be normal. Allow them to be awkward. Allow them to, to look at you. Allow them to put their purse on the other side of the thing without you being offended. Allow healing to happen in the family and you just be there. 
You know, that's more than you could say as we talked about in the first half of this episode that you're not trying to jet out of there after 20 minutes. Go, hey, good to see you guys. Love y'all. <laughs> or you're hiding in the bathroom or you're nodding out. Just be there. Be there and show them <clears throat> that you're a part of this family. And it's okay that they don't trust you. It's okay that people might look at you in a certain way because you are in Christ. Is that here? Oh, wow. The police are coming. Oh, it sounds like it's coming out of my earphones. First. Yeah, that's why I was like, <laughs> is that like, are you telling me it's time to go to a commercial break? <laughs> we'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Yeah. <laughs> Got him again. Got him again. And we're back, and we're back. So we really did just take a commercial break. And that was pretty smooth. That threw me off completely. Yeah. And it's like the alarm really, the siren really did just shut off, by the way. So it might be here. Uh, we're, we're living, the, this studio is on like a road. It's very lo- not a very traveled road. So you hear a siren. It's kind of interesting. But, um, but yeah, I think, I think allowing them to heal, allowing them any, they can't cause you to feel any way. Amen. Don't allow that. that I mean, just like, you know, oh, you made me feel bad. No, you chose to feel bad. Yeah. Uh, give them grace, man. That's one of the biggest things I learned, you know, early on was I got to give the people that love me grace. And, but, but the only way I was able to do that, Chitty, is I was confident mm-hmm. in who I was. Yeah. My identity was secure. Yeah. Now, did I have rocky moments? Yeah. Did I, did I waver in my faith at times and just, I need God's word. I need brothers around me. I need to worship. And yeah, but I was confident in who I was. And because I was confident in who I was in Christ, I could show grace to those, man. Yeah. And that's what's crazy when I look back. Like, it used to offend me when someone would have doubt or question what has happened in my life or or question if I was ever going to go back to the same lifestyle I lived. And it used to offend me, like highly offend me. And I used to be like, how could they ever think that? How could they ever feel that way? Well, fast forward five years, and it's like, Ryan, like, what do you mean how could they think that? What do you mean how could they feel that way? Like, look at how you lived. Look at the pain you caused. Look at the lies you told. Look at the destruction that was upon your life. Look at the darkness that you were dwelling in. And like you're saying, we don't realize as as people who were coming from addiction and had lived that life of the healing that still has to take place in the lives of those around us. Yeah. And we we have this like expectation in in our hearts, I believe, and in our minds that when I'm healed, everybody else should be healed. Now, if I if I said that thought out loud, it sounds irrational. But the posture of our hearts within that is really how we feel. It's like once I'm healed, like come on, stop doubting, stop not trusting in me. I want you to trust me. I want our communication to get back to to better or where it was. I want our relationship to heal. And it's like, that's just not the way it is. Our family, they take time to heal. And like I say, whenever you come through S2L, we have an expedited process of healing because we get submerged in Jesus Christ. And strip everything away. Submerged in the word. We get submerged in classes and church. Our families, a lot of times, are still going through their day-to-day lives, still going to work every day, still taking care of the kids. And dealing with the the consequences of chaos. Dealing with the consequences of everything. And so, yeah, your healing may be more expedited than somebody or one of your loved ones who doesn't have the privilege of laying everything aside and going and and submerging themselves in in Christ and fellowship for an X amount of time, you know? So like you said, giving them grace and knowing that, hey, everybody's healing is going to look different. Everybody's going to be on a different pace when it comes to that. But nonetheless, like, I don't want to say they're justified in how they feel, but there's a reason. If yeah. somebody did the things that I did to somebody else, I would feel the exact same way. Yeah. Jorian, you got anything you want to add? Producer Jorian, you want to add anything uh, just about holidays and, and identity and things like that? Yeah, I would say having grace is definitely the best thing you can do um yeah i agree with everything you guys have said um with families that's i would say with if you have uh members that are struggling with addiction um yeah show grace to them they're going through addiction i would say of course don't excuse um their behavior but have grace for them uh make them feel like they're at home like they're they are family uh, and for those who are struggling with addiction, I would say, uh, echoing what they said, be be present, be there, um, be with your family, uh, feel that love, um, and yeah, enjoy the holiday, enjoy enjoy this season. It's a blessed season. Um, 
the the reason for the season is grace, the grace of God. Mm -hmm. So just remember that. Um, And yeah, and just have a blessed time with family. Amen. Let me let me read this yeah. psalm real quick. Um, and then I got I got some things that, that to close us out with. I, I just want to add, but yeah, let's hit this. Yeah, I'm gonna read this Psalm 100, and this is a call to come before the Lord in worship Ooh. because He is good. And this could be to a family he member struggling good. with love, uh, struggling with a loved one who's going through addiction. This could be a guy who's struggling with addiction. This is could be a guy who's freshly out of rehab. Whatever the case may be, man, this is a call to come before the Lord in worship. This is Psalm 100, one through five. And it says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name for Mm. the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures endures forever forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. And this is regardless of what season you're in. When I read this, I always go back to being in the darkest season of my life. And what changed was my posture towards the Lord. Instead of complaining, instead of talking about everything that had happened to me, instead of saying I have the worst life, instead of saying I'll never get over this addiction, man, my heart changed and started worshiping and thanking and praising God. And within that, I realized I have everything I've ever needed. Yeah. You know, and so it doesn't matter what season you're in. It could be to an unbeliever. It could be to a believer. It could be to an addict. It could be to the loved one of an addict. Man, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter into the presence of the Lord with thanks. Yeah. And get, give thanks during the season of all that he's done in your life. It's so easy to get caught up in that negative mindset of this is wrong, that's wrong, life sucks, media sucks, this sucks. And just, you know, it, it, af- it affects how we think. It affects how we act. It affects how we talk. It affects more than just what we think, you know. Um, It affects every aspect of our life. But if you can change that posture to giving thanks and giving praise, I promise, man, there's so much more good that flows from that, that it'll change everything for you. Yeah, man, that's so good. Yeah. And I I just want to close with this. So we've addressed the families of the loved ones struggling with addiction. We've addressed the people that are in a recovery process uh, and are nervous and, and wouldn't say that they're recovered. Uh, but the reality is, is, is because of the popularity of the show, <laughs> there's probably people watching this that are on one, you know, mm-hmm. they're on one right now. And it's the day after Thanksgiving and entering into the Christmas season, man, every the black Friday, the Christmas lights go up, the Santa Claus things floats, which is none of that is Christmas in the meaning of the season, but but that's what triggers these emotions. And it's like, oh man, a big holiday season coming up. I want you to know that there's hope. Yeah, maybe you just spent another Thanksgiving hiring a football bat or buzzed or in and out so you can go get your shot or in and out so you can go get your snort or smoke or whatever it is. Man, you're watching this, that means that there's a reason, right? That if you're watching this, it means that there's there's something in you that longs for more. If you're watching this, that means that God's sovereign decree, the places and boundaries of time that he ordained, has put this in front of you. And I want you to know from experience, there's hope, man. Mm. Uh, but don't wait. Reach out and get help now. No, I'll do it after Christmas. I just want to be there for Christmas. Word. You weren't there for Thanksgiving. And if you were, you weren't. Reach out and get help now. And the reason I say that is because people are dying. They put off, oh, I'm going into rehab tomorrow, and they die and don't make it in. Happens. It happens. I know that it happens. There's hope, though. Let me tell you a story. I personally, actually, let me start with biblically. God tells us that he loves us and that those who are weary and heavy laden, that if you come to me, all who are heavy laden, weary, struggling, tired, stressed, tired of living a life of of just the rat race of being on one, of family lying to you, you to them, I mean, and web and just this alone place. There's hope. Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest for your soul. 
It's a promise of God. It's not promise that you haven't screwed everything up and the fam- your family might not ever allow you back to Christmas or Thanksgiving again. And you know what? That's okay too. Because let me tell you something. You could start your own tradition with your own family. Let me tell you a story. There were many years, many, many, many years that I was on one at holidays. Uh, just like we talked about, I was either high in the bathroom snorting something or I was in for just a few minutes and then out. And my, and my mom, I mean, it was just like my family was like, extended family's there and her own son mm-hmm. comes in and dips out. Yeah. All these plans and all this effort that goes into these holidays, and I can't wait to leave. Or I just don't show up. Yeah. Or I'm high. Or I'm whatever, and it's just like, or my mood swing. I mean, you get it. You know, it, it Maybe. Man, it's gone from that to being... Early on, just like people looking, you know, after rehab, just like the awkward, I don't know what to do, well, just like we discussed. Oh, yeah. There's hope because now we've started, not not because of my family wouldn't allow it, but just because of the logistics. Now Thanksgiving's at my house. Now now people travel to our house for Thanksgiving. Now when, when <laughs> I'm a pastor, right, that might not be your story, but... The family seen the righteousness in me, and now I'm praying before family meals, right? But the whole family gathered. That wasn't the case a short few years ago. And I tell you this not to boost me up. I tell you this because there's hope. I did nothing but be obedient to God and surrender. When I try to do it my way, I went to rehab after rehab after rehab and just wrecked things. So I'm not boasting in Adam. I'm boasting in what God can do to a broke, busted, disgusted uh, addict. Man, he could sanctify you. He could save you. He can he can be a beacon of hope through you. And it might not be your direct family. I don't want to fly a false flag. There is hope for restoration there, but it might be your own traditions. Man, maybe you're called to this year to have people that don't have family in, and you start your own tradition. But I'm telling you, there's hope after it. There's prayer after it. You like you can you could be the one that is the godly person at your Thanksgiving event to where at one point they are hiding the purse. And here's what that is: that's life after addiction. Mm-hmm. And you better believe it. Come on. Thank you for listening to this episode of Life After Addiction. Life After Addiction is a production of S2L Studio. For more Christ-centered addiction recovery resources, please visit s2l.net. That's S, the number two, L, dot net. For more information about S2L's licensed and accredited residential program, please visit s2lrecovery.org. That's S, the number two, lrecovery.org.